I'll get in uh, to this very quickly since I know we're a bit constrained on time. Uh, for the last five years or so, I've been studying media piracy and enforcement, first at the Social Science Research Council and now at the American Assembly at Columbia University. And I've had the tremendous privilege to be involved in a project called Media Piracy in Emerging Economies, uh, which brought together around 35 researchers over four years from about a dozen countries in the first large-scale comparative study of the topic. So today I'm going to talk about piracy and enforcement. And I'll touch on the, piracy, the media piracy study and also on some newer work called Copy Culture in the US and Germany. And while doing so, I'll try to bring this back to illuminate some of the questions around publishing and also some of the remarkable events of the last few months. The massive opposition to the Stop Online Piracy Act and in Europe, the emergence of large-scale opposition to the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement, or ACTA. Now, SOPA and ACTA are very different proposals, and I won't get into the details here, but they share an overall purpose. Both are intended to create the legal and institutional basis for much stronger enforcement online. And as little as three or four months ago, both looked like done deals. Now they're in the middle of a very powerful political mobilization on the part of web users and web companies. Now we're beginning to have a conversation not just about online piracy, but about the convergence of citizenship, democratic accountability, and different rights as they relate to the internet. So for anyone who's been involved in these questions over the last few years, it's a very exciting moment. Now, when we looked at piracy and enforcement in middle and low income countries, we reached some very simple conclusions. High prices, low incomes, and cheap digital technologies are the main ingredients of media piracy. Enforcement is largely irrelevant. Enforcement is what happens around the edges of these underlying economic drivers. To put it differently, over the last decade, we've seen a massive expansion in the infrastructure for digital consumption and copying. DVD and MP3 players, computer storage, broad broadband, I don't need to enumerate them. At the same time, there's been very little corresponding increase in the affordability or availability of legal digital media goods in most countries. And it's no coincidence that in Europe, anti-ACTA sentiment and anti-ACTA protests have been concentrated and strongest in the countries where those contradictions are the sharpest. In Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Slovenia, Bulgaria. These are the low-income countries of Europe that are fully integrated into the global media culture, but in which few people can afford to participate in that culture. And that's the contradiction that we document from across six countries in this report. When you look at how enforcement works in middle and low income countries, you find a pretty simple, consistent pattern. You find raid-based enforcement, characterized by the ramping up of police actions and little to no follow through. There's little likelihood that these cases will make it through to a trial, and in fact, little expectation that they will. Here are the numbers for Brazil, if you're curious. And there's a very simple explanation for this discrepancy. It's cheaper to buy cops than lawyers. Raids are cheap, but due process is expensive and slow. It doesn't scale well. Not in Brazil, not in China, and not in the US. So the returns on prosecuting piracy at the low end among file sharers or street vendors of DVDs are very low. And so you get into situations where the few cases that do make it through, through the courts end up in forms of punishment as spectacle. In prison sentences in the, the number in the years, in fines numbering in the millions of dollars, in the hopes that these few cases will have a dissuasive effect on others. And I think that everybody involved in this process now appreciates the futility of this approach. So the new enforcement measures are trying to do something different. They're all about abridging due process, of doing away with the things that cost a lot of money in the prosecution of file sharing, especially. Doing away with adversarial hearings before a judge, with high evidentiary standards for conviction, and with the, po the potential for lengthy appeals. The only way to scale up enforcement is to take it out of the courts, and to make it an administrative function, and whenever possible, an automated one. And that's what you see in recent laws uh, for disconnecting repeat infringers, the so-called three strikes laws, 
where the strikes are determined, are determined by automated systems. It's what you see in measures like SOPA, which shift the liability for infringement to, to providers of web services, web intermediaries, and make them responsible for the surveillance and enforcement of the activity of their users. In August and September, we had the opportunity to survey 2,300 Americans and about 1,000 Germans to ask about their digital media practices and habits. And we took the opportunity to ask a lot of questions around file sharing, penalties for infringement, and filtering and site blocking. And the first thing we learned is that there's a lot of casual infringement, but very little large-scale or hardcore infringement. There aren't many hardcore pirates, 1 to 3%, according to our data. The second thing we learned is that there are big generational differences in practices and attitudes. I'm sure this doesn't come as a surprise to this audience. The short version is that 18 to 29-year-olds will share files with friends. And friends is a blurry category that may number in the, in the threes or tens and may number in the 300s or thousands. Uh, for many, it will involve sharing over the internet. And at the same time, there's much more reticence about active participation in things that look like large-scale anonymous uh, sharing through you know, the, the type of sharing that, that uh, uh, most file sharing networks uh, involve. Though there, too, the numbers skew young. We also found that there just isn't much support for penalties. Only a bare majority of Americans support any penalties at, uh, at all for infringement, and, and only minimal support among those for serious penalties like internet disconnection. And when you ask about appropriate fines among that 51% that support fines, the answers are very low. 75% put the number under $100. The current statutory penalty goes up to $150,000 per infringing act. Our conclusion is that people do not view file sharing as a serious offense, and we see no evidence that educational efforts will change that. And since SOPA and PIPA were looming uh, at the time of this survey, we wanted to see what people thought about filtering and blocking infringing content. And the answers were complicated. People don't have clear opinions on things like site blocking or search filtering. When you call them up and ask them, it's probably the first time they've even heard the question. So responses are very volatile, and they depend on the wording and the order of questions. So we asked a lot of questions with variations on keywords like blocking, filtering, and censoring, but all describing roughly the same action. And I'll ask for your patience with this chart, because the results show something important. They show the beginning of an ordering of values online. And I say ordering because at this point, it's not enough to just ask the simple questions. Should copyright be enforced, or should creators be remunerated? Values are converging on the internet. And as a result, values are coming into conflict. It's a common platform for all sorts of human activity and expression. And so the important questions are, when values conflict, which matter more? So on the left side of this chart, you have the simple questions, or the easy ones from our perspective. That, you know, should services like Facebook or Dropbox try to screen user activity to remove pirate, uh, pirated files? The language is very soft. They can just try and satisfy the terms of the question. It suggests no, co no costs of enforcement. And you get 61% support. Moving right, the language gets a bit harder. Should ISPs be required to block sites that infringe? Should search engines be required to block sites from search results? Opinion flips negative as soon as the government gets involved. <laughs> or when censorship is invoked, or when both are involved. Government censorship, 64% oppose. Now, actually, that strikes me as a remarkably low number. You've got over 30% support for government censorship of the web. Quite extraordinary. And by the time we're in the green zone of this chart, we're talking about explicit constraints on free speech and privacy. And for me, the interesting, que the interesting questions are the last two on this chart. Would you support blocking of sites if some legal content were also blocked? 57% say no. That, in effect, is the mega upload case a takedown of massive quantities of infringing material, but also a lot of legitimate material with no recourse for getting it back. 
The last question, should your, internet, should your internet use be monitored in order to prevent copyright infringement? That's a privacy question. 69% say no. And to me, the last two represent a clear ordering of free speech and privacy ahead of copyright protection. Although 61% would support shifting responsibility for enforcement to Facebook, 69% reject the means of doing so. So in my view, the relevant numbers for SOPA, PIPA, and other comparably, uh, uh, you know, other recent enforcement measures are really in this green zone where you're talking about the, the, the conflict in values that occur as these measures begin to be applied online. And of course, this is the US, and answers to these types of questions have a high degree of cultural specificity. So when you ask the same questions in Germany, you get a very different ordering of preferences. You get significantly higher levels of support for enforcement across the board until you get to privacy. So privacy here figures as a core value for Germans, capable of overriding much higher levels of support for enforcement and higher levels of trust in institutions. It's why Google and Facebook have had so much trouble in Germany with stuff like Street View and social plugins. Companies have less scope to collect data and develop profiles on their users. So the prospects of large-scale copyright enforcement and copyright surveillance in this context in particular seem remote. So in my brief remaining time, I want to pull this back to publishing. Our next project is called The Ecology of Access to Educational Materials in Developing World Universities. And for obvious reasons, uh, we prefer the short title, Shadow Libraries. And I'll explain what that means. But, but first, by, by ecology, I mean the relationships between the different levels and forms of access to materials that shape educational trajectories in these universities. Traditionally, when people have talked about access, they've talked about two institutions, the commercial market and the library. And the dilemma in developing countries has always been that the commercial market is tiny and high-priced, and the library is under-resourced and inadequate to educational needs. So there's been a lot of interest recently around a third thing, open educational resources, work that can circulate freely and be used uh, without license in educational contexts. But even this isn't a complete picture. There were always copy shops around these universities, and arguably the copy shops played a larger role in serving the educational needs of those communities. They were the form of cheap access and, and de facto piracy of, of texts and educational materials. Prior to the 2000s, copy shops around universities were the scene of many of the, of the sharpest conflicts around intellectual property policy and enforcement in developing countries. But now this, uh, now this is changing again. We're seeing the emergence of, of something rather different. We're seeing ma uh, the emergence of massive digital copying, and in particular, the building, sharing, and curation of large digital archives by students, faculty, bibliophiles. These are what we call shadow libraries. Some of them become quite formalized. Some of them become uh, implicitly uh, uh, adopted by, by the universities in these contexts. So the real question we're going to ask is what happens when the access problem is solved without any corresponding solution to the crisis of the library or the commercial market? Another way to put this is that there will be access. The question is, who will make it convenient and affordable? And the real challenge for open educational research projects at the end of the day is that they aren't competing with the commercial market. They're competing with the pirate market. They're competing with a copy culture that hasn't waited for approved institutional solutions to emerge. And as digital readers get very, very cheap in the next few years, that copy culture is going to grow exponentially and produce a huge democratization in educational opportunity and access to knowledge in these countries. And that will be a hugely disruptive challenge for all parties involved and produce its own calls for enforcement and control. So internally, we call this the publishing panic of 2015. And that's the conversation we want to be a part of as this study gets underway in the next year or so.
So by way of conclusion, I want to acknowledge that many people, especially when I'm talking to uh, industry audiences, find this work depressing. Uh, the word terrifying has been used. I'm not sure, I wasn't sure how to take that as criticism or compliments or what to do about it. But behind this reaction, I think, is a very legitimate concern that it's not enough to simply say SOPA is bad or that enforcement doesn't work, even among people who agree. We need to develop a positive set of proposals for what we want collectively, for what the public interest is in and around intellectual property. What's the positive agenda? It's a very fair question. So while I have my own views on this, I've also been involved in efforts to develop a more collective, consensual account of the public interest in intellectual property policy, one that recognizes the needs of both creators and publics, past and future. And since I'm at the end of my 14 minutes, I won't do much more than point you toward the, the, the fruit of that project, the Washington Declaration on Intellectual Property and the Public Interest, which we released in, in September of this year. It's a very reasonable statement mixing obvious proposals like stop extending copyright with more technical proposals like defending the for sale doctrine in national law. And I'd invite you to read it, and if you agree that it represents a step forward in our collective conversation about intellectual property, I invite you to endorse it and help circulate it. There were, last time I looked, about 900 signatures. And as I've tried to argue, it's a very important moment to do so. It's an important it's very important to turn some of that anti-SOPA, anti-ACTA energy into a positive public interest policy agenda, and also a global agenda. The, the, the Washington Declaration is a good place to start. Thank you very much.